So I would like to welcome everyone to the Department of Food, Nutrition, Dietetics, and Health uh, 48th Annual Grace M. Shukart Lecture. This annual lecture. Do you, need, do you need the IT guy? Uh, yeah, come on. No, actually, come around. <laughs> We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, this annual lecture series brings dietitians and food service and hospitality experts to Kansas State University to enrich student curricula and providing continuing education for practitioners in the field. The established in 1975, the lecture series is a long-standing tribute to Ms. Shugart's accomplishments as a leader in the dietetics profession, where she served as president of the American Dietetics Association, which is currently now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She was also a department head in the College of Human Ecology, which is now the College of Health and Human Sciences, as well as a visionary for food management education throughout the country. Ms. Schubert also was a medallion award winner and received the Marjorie Holzheiser Holper Award for the Academy. She not be here, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, she also, I will repeat, she also received a medallion award. She was a medallion award winner and received the Marjorie Holzheiser Cultural Award, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics highest honor. We have invited Ms. Shugart's grandson, Jeff, and his wife, Joanne, to join us for this prestigious uh, lecture series. So will everyone please welcome me and welcome Jeff to come and just say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Tanda. And I want to thank all of you for showing up today. And thank you, Vista, for coming. I noticed we have something in common. We're federal employees. I'm a retired federal employee. You were a Department of Agriculture. I was a little more destructive, Department of the Army. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to say, make a short correction. Grace was my step grandmother. My grandfather uh, divorced and married Grace up in Iowa. She she came from Walla Walla, Washington, got a degree, went to Iowa State, and then moved to the great K State College and uh, spent many years here. I remember. She was closer to me as a grandmother than my actual grandmother. My grandmother lived out on the East Coast in Baltimore, and Grace was here, and my dad would come down quite often to visit. And uh, it was, she was a very proper dietitian, person, server, I guess. Uh, she, when we would come, she'd have a little cart at breakfast time, and she'd be making toast right there and everything. But uh, she was a wonderful person, and thank you again for coming. Thank you, Jeff, and we would like to thank the Shugart family for their continued support for this event. Uh, next, I would like to recognize the retirees in the room. So if you are a retiree, please stand. And I know we have several. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And do we have any alums in the room? You can stand. Go ahead and stand. Go ahead. Some of us are alums. You can stand. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Beckler. Yes, and then I will also invite Dr. Binky to stand. Dr. Binky is our interim dean. Yes, thank you. And lastly, can I get the FNDH faculty members to please stand? Thank you so much for coming. 
So now let's introduce this year's speaker. So we have Dr. Vista Suarez Fletcher. I don't want to get that part. She is this year's 48th annual Grace Shoes Art Speaker. Dr. Fletcher is a regional administrator of the United States Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Services, FNS, and is housed in the Midwest Region Office in Chicago. Dr. Fletcher is a registered dietitian and has vast experience working with child nutrition programs at the state, local, and federal levels. Dr. Fletcher completed her BS and her MS degrees in dietetics and nutrition at Florida State University. Upon completion of her MS, she attended Kansas State University, where she received her Doctor of Philosophy in Human Ecology with a specialization in institution management in 2000. This presentation is approved for one of the EU by CDR and KDAT. Attendees earning the EUs today will complete the pre and post evaluation. If you have not received one, please make certain you get one. Uh, they are just right outside the door. You will complete the pre and post evaluation and return it to the welcome table to pick up your certificate. If you did not pick up one, like I said, you can do so at the welcome table after the presentation. For those who are attending on Zoom, you will receive an email within 48 hours with a link to the pre and post evaluation and the certificate. This presentation is being recorded and it will be housed on the Shugart Lecture webpage. And those watching the recording will not be eligible to receive uh, the EUs. I also would like to uh, let everyone know that Dr. Fletcher has no disclosures to share related to this series. So now let's please welcome Dr. Vistas Florence Fletcher. It just turns the switch on top on. So, like, now let's get to fix it. This way you can move your arm around. Oh, I can roll? Yeah, you may. I don't have to pay you? Nope. Oh, okay, okay. All right. I thought I had to stuck here. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> That was pretty good. I had so I, this is I did two classes earlier, and sometimes students will just be like, "Good afternoon." So that was, that was a little better. So thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Kidd, for the introduction. I first want to say thank you to the committee for inviting me to be here. It's been such a pleasure to be back here at K State. So thank you to all of you, and I want to make sure I don't forget anybody. So um, Tom the Kid, Heidi, Override. Jennifer Hansen, Kathleen Haas, Karen Rogers, and Chelsea Medved. So thank you all for everything that you did to, to bring this together. I also want to say thank you to the faculty and staff. Got an opportunity to spend some time with, with you today and, and meet and connect, which was which was an absolute pleasure. And some students I saw earlier today and they came back. So really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. And certainly finally to the Schubert family really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of such a tremendous legacy. I know that Dr. Schubert was a passionate trailblazer for food service and dietetics, so I am very honored and humbled to be here. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Now, Dr. Kidd stole a little bit of my thunder. I know y'all already stood up a little bit, so I'm going to do another little exercise. So we can get the juices flowing a little bit. It will be a little bit interactive. So. K-State is a great university, wouldn't we all agree? Yeah. So I'm going to kind of get a feel for how connected and how long you have been connected to this great university. So if you would, if you can, and if you don't mind, would you all please stand up? Shake it off. So we're going to see. We're going to see longevity here. So if you have been at K-State or connected for less than a year, you can have a seat. Okay, so these I'm assuming are freshmen, maybe some new graduate students. So one to three years. If you've been here one to three years, you can have a seat. So, okay, so we got some sophomores, juniors. I know some graduate students met earlier. All right, so four to nine years. Four to nine. Who got four to nine? Okay, all right, so probably some seniors and some faculty. All right, 10 to 15. 
Okay. Stand it up. 16 to 20. Okay, there you go. Okay. All right. We've got some holdouts here. All right. Now, 21 to 25. Okay. Oh, some that one's still standing. Okay. All right. 26 to 30. Okay, now this is going a little further than I thought. <laughs> so, all right, let's do 30. Now, this is year now, 31 to 33. Okay. <laughs> all right, now, okay, now, those still standing, you've been here for more than 33 years. Okay, so I'm going to need you to just, again, just say who you are and what you do. So, over here. I started here as a K-State student, so that was over 38. Okay, 38. We're going to see if we can get past 38. Okay, well, thank you. All right. Carol Shankman, that was uh, Meredith Dean and Professor Meredith. I came in 1990 from the Department of Hospitality and Well, Food, Nutrition, and Well, so restaurants. Hospitality Institution Management Dietetics. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Tell you a story. It's about winners and losers. 
I learned this lesson very, very early. So fourth grade, there was a little popularity contest. Well, you could be the princess at the school. So I just knew that I was going to be the princess. And when they called my friend's name, I was devastated. You thought somebody had passed away. I was really very, because I just knew I had won. And I remember getting in the car with my mom and my godmom, and they, I just couldn't wait to fall out crying. And they were like, no, ma'am. This the, we are not going to respond like this. In life, you're going to win sometimes, and sometimes you're going to lose, but you cannot be a sore loser. And that was such a powerful message. And all, for all of us, sometimes we get raises, sometimes we get promotions, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get jobs that we apply for, sometimes we don't. But we take the lessons and we learn, but you can't respond neg negatively. And then the, the last thing was your response in the face of adversity matters because we all are going to face adversity in this life. Second, so my past a little bit, I was a pretty good student. I went to Mulberry High School. Anybody ever heard of Mulberry? Okay, so I shake my head. So, and not Mayberry, Mulberry. Little small um, phosphate community. And I learned early on that school lunch was my thing favorite time of the day. <laughs> I couldn't wait to see the menu to see what they were going to be serving for school lunch. Anybody remember their favorite school lunch? What were some of your favorites? Hamburger and gravy, okay. Mashed potato? Pizza? Oh, cinnamon roll, okay. Okay, bringing back memories. My favorite was shepherd's pie. When I first saw it on the menu, I'm like, what kind of pie is this? So I was really shocked at what I got, but love shepherd's pie. So it was my favorite time of the day. So when I was in a senior in high school, the school food service staff in my county raised $500 to give a scholarship to a student who was interested in a career in nutrition or hospitality or something related to food service. And I got their first ever scholarship. So... They invited me to come to their banquet, and there was like hundreds of people in the audience, and I just remember being a high school senior, like, oh my goodness. But I went and said, thank you for the scholarship. I really appreciate it. I know you worked hard, and I hope to make you proud. So we'll, we'll come back to this one day, I mean, later today. So my high school class, about 100 graduating students. Anybody similar? Did y'all have big classes? or? Big? Okay. Well, only about 100 in Mulberry. That's all we had. So, next were my college years. I went to Florida State University, and I soon learned that I was not in Mulberry anymore. <laughs> I go from this small school to a university with over 25,000 students. I had more students in one class than I think were at the entire school in Mulberry. And I lived in the Southern Scholarship House. So this was the first house that I lived in, the Rotary Scholarship House, and learned a lot of lessons there as well. But I decided while I was at Florida State that I wanted to pursue my degree in dietetics. So I got my bachelor's degree in dietetics and then in nutrition. And I did an AP4 or the approved pre-professional practice program. So I was able to get my master's degree and my dietetic internship experience all together. So that was fantastic for me. And I knew that my interest was in food service management. Now, most of my classmates, what do you think they were interested in? Clinical. So I was kind of the odd woman out, like everybody else like um, clinical, but I was very interested in food service management. But just some lessons that I learned while at Florida State was integrity. You know, do the right thing. And the story there, you know, my parents dropped me off at this big university, and I remember going to the bookstore to buy my book. I hadn't been there a week. I go to the store, I put my books, my $500 worth of books on the counter, and the young lady behind the counter says, give me $100, I won't give you a receipt, and you can take the books. And I was thinking, hmm. Now, that doesn't sound quite right. I said, no, no, 
Ring them up. I I want my receipt. Ring them up. And she was like, "No, you, you like you don't understand. I'm giving you a, a deal here." And I just thought about it, and I said, "You know, mm, doesn't feel right. Ring up my books, please, ma'am, and give me my receipt." So she did, and I went home, and I I told a couple friends. Now, would anybody else have taken that deal? You can be honest. <laughs> so. I went home and I shared it with some of my friends, and they're like, "What were you? It was like a four hundred dollar gift. What were you thinking?" But I called my dad, and he said, "I am so proud of you because you did the right thing." He said, "Your college career could have been over, like right as you walked out that door." So you know, in life, some things sound good, but they're not always good. So students, remember that just because it glitters doesn't mean it's gold. So just Always think about doing the right thing, even when nobody's listening. And then I also started growing very comfortable with change because, again, I'm in a different environment. I'm living in a scholarship house with 12 other girls who are very different from me. So it really taught me to value diversity. And as I was finishing at Florida State, I wanted to go back to the school food service professionals to say, hey, you gave me a scholarship. And I know sometimes people get scholarships. You never know what happens to students. But I wanted them to know that I appreciated the scholarship and did what I was supposed to do. So I was going to um, get my degree. I finished my degree. and was going to get my master's degree. So I'm finishing up at Florida State. I'm tired of school. Like, OK, been in school a long time, ready to be done. And my major professor and my deans were like, this stuff. You should go get your PhD. I said, PH what? <laughs> so, you know, it was not in my plans, but obviously others saw something in me that I did not see in myself. So here we are at Kansas State University. Now, let, I'm going to just be really honest. Can I be honest with you all today? So now Kansas was not on my radar. <laughs> I'm in Florida, nice and warm, you know, Kansas was not on my radar, but my major professor was like, you should consider Kansas State. She knew what a great program it was here. So I said, okay, I'll do it. But I really was trying to stay in the Southeast, wasn't trying to move to the Midwest. But I applied anyway, and I applied to some other schools. And I remember her running one day saying, this stuff, this stuff, you got a fellowship at Kansas State. So I said, I guess I'm going to be going to Kansas State. I made up my mind, but I still struggled. I remember being on the phone with my dean saying, you know what? I don't know about this. I like, I don't know anybody in Kansas. I have not lost anything in Kansas. I don't think I want to go. She said, this stuff. It was almost like if she was there, she would have been like, you know, like slapped me out of it. She was like, this stuff. You need to get out of your comfort zone. It'll be good for you. You need to go. I still was having my doubts, and I talked to my mom, and what she said to me is, Vista, you can do anything for a little while. You don't have to go and stay in Kansas for 30 years. You go. You know what you got to do. You make a plan. You get it done. If you love it, that's great, but you can, you can move on. So you can do anything for a little while, and it was such a powerful message for me. Because after going to Kansas, I felt like I can go and live anywhere. It really was that. <laughs> that's not bad. It was just taking that initial step. Like, I can do this. So it really yeah, it empowered me. Because, you know, you can tell I've been to a lot of different places. But it just took that initial get out of your comfort zone. You can do this. So I really do feel like I can live anywhere now. And I also learned the importance of mentorship. Now, this lady right here, y'all know Dr. Carol Shanklin. Before I got to Kansas State, she was a blessing. I don't even want to get emotional, but <laughs> she was a blessing when I was here, and she continues to be a blessing. I wasn't sure. She made me feel like she wanted me to be here. I, you know, this was before the days where you could go online and look at apartments online. She had a student. I had picked out an apartment, didn't even know how it was going to look. She had a student go take pictures and send those to me so I could see where I was going to be living. That made an impression. When I got to K-State, we decided she was going to be my major professor. 
And I said, I went back to what my mom said, you don't have to be anywhere for a long time. I was like, Dr. Shanklin, three year, I want to be on the three year plan. I'm not trying to be here for, I love you, but not trying to be here for long. She said, you do what you need to do and we will get you out of here. And she worked hard every week. Every week she was like, this is what we need to do. And I made sure to do what I needed to do because I knew she was going to do what she needed and I didn't want to disappoint her. So she has been phenomenal. And even after leaving K-State 24 years later, she's still a mentor. She's there when I have to make decisions about jobs. You know, she's always there. And um, and I was telling the students earlier, how many people can say they've been to an amusement park with their major professor? <laughs> can anybody in here say that? We went to Animal Kingdom and Dr. Shanklin wore me out. <laughs> I could barely keep up with her, but she's been amazing. So such a blessing to me um, coming here. And, and coming to K-State was one of the best decisions of my life. So, you know, just until... Dr. Barrett, Mr. P, Dr. Gould, Dr. Canner, so many people poured into me while I was here. So just really appreciate it. So kudos to all of you, because I would not be here without all of you. And so another lesson was the RD exam. How many of us have taken that? So soon after I got to K-State, it was like, okay, time to take the exam. I think the pass rate now is about maybe 60%, but I was like, do I want to invest in a course? one of the study courses, and, and it was a big investment for me, but I'm so glad I did. So if you have the opportunity and you can, taking courses to help you, getting help with your resume, all of those things are investments in your career. So I would definitely recommend those. So finished my three years at K-State, got my PhD in human ecology with a specialization in institutional management. So it's like, okay, what do I do now? Am I going to be Professor Suarez? You know, what's going to be my path? So what am I going to do with all these degrees and my RD credentials? You know, where am I going? So what I will share is some folks at K-State and at Florida State were like, you really should be a professor. These are people who had poured into me. And I was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm not sure. You know, my passion was pulling me towards school nutrition. So it was really difficult to say like, oh, no, I think, you know, maybe not right now. This is something that I'm going to do. So my first job was with the Nevada Department of Education. And the message there was to be persistent. So as I was finishing up at K-State, I was looking for a job. I was always on the American School Food Service Association site looking for a job. And I saw one that was in Las Vegas. And, I, and it was with Child Nutrition Program. So I'm like, this, this will probably be a good match for me. I called them and I said, I'm a student. I finished up in May. I'm really interested in the job. They said, you know what? Mm -mm. Don't bother. We're looking for someone to start right away. So no need to apply. And I could have been like, well, oh, man, too bad. But I called them back. I said, well, can I at least send you my resume? And they said, sure, you can send the resume. I sent my resume, and I don't know what was on my resume because I had been a career student, but they were like, you can apply for the job. So I was like, okay, wow, this is great. So, of course, when it's time for, to interview, they don't pay for you to come to, it's a state job. So unlike private, you know, they don't cover that expense. So they said, we can do a phone interview for you, but you have to do a presentation as a part of the interview process. So I'm like, how am I gonna do this? So I go to the HRIMD office and I say, do you, now this was before the year, you know, now anybody can record anything, right? We got our iPhones and all of our phones, but this was 25 years ago. So I go to the office and say, hey, I need a camcorder, we got you. So they, get, they got me, a, I was able to use the camcorder. So the Department of Education, they said, we will send you the scenario. You'll have 24 hours to record it and get it back to us. So I had a short turnaround time, grabbed one of my colleagues, one of my classmates, and recorded a video, tried to make it interactive. It was on the special milk program. And I took, did the interview. They said, we'll be back with you in a week. They called me like in an hour and said, you got the job. So I was so, be persistent. 
Don't always just take the first no for an answer. You know, be a little bit diligent. So great experience there as a child nutrition consultant with the Department of Education. Then on to Orlando, where I worked for Orange County Public Schools for another K-State graduate, Laura Gilbert. Not sure if any of you know Laura, but worked for her. And she was the director. I worked as like a supervisor under her, but had actually applied to be the director. And thank God I did not get the job. Sometimes, you know, we don't need, sometimes the things we want are not the things we need because I would not have been prepared. I needed to work under Laura to get that experience. And it was a great experience. I, that was my first time as a supervisor and I learned to lead. So the, the push continues. I'm in Orlando. I'm close, I'm back close to home. I'm happy. And someone says, there is a job in Richmond, Virginia as a director. You should really consider being a director. And I'm thinking, mm, nope, I'm happy where I am. And the I went to a conference in Baltimore. And while I was there, the ladies were there. And I was like, oh my goodness, they're going to ask me about this job again. And they're like, have you applied for the job? I had not. I go to a reception. And at the reception, my dad and I were there. There must have been hundreds of people. This man comes up to me and says, can I sit with you? Sure. I said, are you a school food service director? He said, no, but my wife used to be in Richmond. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. And he says, you know, I know they're looking for a director. And he said, they got some stuff going on there. Whoever gets the job is going to be up for a big challenge. So my radars are like, is this, you know, somebody telling me, like, definitely not to apply for this job. But I did anyway. And it was, it was a, a great experience. I pulled my team together. We were able to get out of a million dollar deficit. But one of the things that I learned, and I had never been a director before, so it was a huge task, but working with my team, we were able to get it done. One of the things that one of the employees told me there, he said, Dr. Suarez, he said, I would respect you and we'll, we'll go through a wall for you. And he said, it's not because of your title, but because of who you are. So it's really all about valuing and respecting people, and people will follow you. So next was to Memphis, another stretch opportunity. In Richmond, I had about a $10 million budget. Memphis was about a $55 million budget. A lot more students. Cochill operation, it was huge. And they had some challenges there as well. But came in and worked with my team and really tried to make a difference. I hired several chefs to work with me in my central kitchen and to go out to all my schools. That's one of the chefs with the burgundy on. He had never worked in school food service. He has since gone on to do some things with the White House. Chefs moved to school. He's been a leader in the Child Nutrition Association in Tennessee. So he's done a lot of great work. Really proud of him, Chef T. Also, when I got to Memphis, the nutritionist said to me, Anybody heard of the Physicians for Responsible Medicine? They do a, like a report card of school food service. And the district had not gotten a good report previously. They said, we asked the Physicians for Responsible Medicine to give us some time. We're getting a new director. So give us a little bit of time so we can make some changes. Two months after I left, they called and said, we got the Golden Carrot Award. So we were able to change things around, make changes to the menu, vegetarian options, got a lot of student feedback. So we were able to make some really positive changes. Also created some partnerships. Breakfast is a big focus for school food service. Partnered with the Memphis Grizzlies and the University of Memphis to really do some things to really turn our food services and school breakfast around. And so too, just lessons in faith. I'm a person of faith. And I just learned that all things work together for the good. It might not be where you think you're supposed to be, but you'll always land where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. And so next chapter, I'm with USDA, Food and Nutrition Service, and our mission is to increase food security and reduce hunger. So question for you, and I have a little prize for one person who can get it right, and maybe a student was in the class earlier, but we serve how, one out of how many people are served in our nutrition assistance program. Anybody know? Wait, what, 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 anybody can guess who's interactive. 
One five, okay, that's close. Anybody else? Okay, close, close. Eight, okay. What about one out of four? So we serve one out of four um, Americans in our program. Our, yeah, one out of four are served by USA Nutrition Assistance Program. So how many programs do we have? It's not for a grade, <laughs> so you can answer. Just guess. Well, how, does anybody know any USDA nutrition assistance programs that you just kind of can call off with? Now? What, what I hear? CACFP? Yep. Okay. So you got, you got, you got several. We have 16 programs. Um, yeah, and so you can't see all of them, but I know everybody's heard National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast, we have Fresh Fruit and Vegetables, Summer, Child and Adult Care, we have the Summer Food Service Program, the Emergency Food Assistance, Commodity Supplemental, Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations, with Farmers Market, Senior Farmers Market, we have the Patrick Leahy Farmers School, SNAP, and we have the Summer Electronic Benefit Transfer Program. So, a couple questions for you. So the state of Kansas will be one of 46 state tribes and territories to launch this new FNS program in 2024. Okay, summer, everybody think Dr. Shepherd got that? Summer EBT? Okay, so correct. That's the summer EBT program. And with that program, students who are eligible for free reduced price meals or can be directly certified will get $120 during the summer but for each child. And that will really help parents to meet in, to make ends meet and get some nutritious food. So that's summer EBT. So how many students do you think we estimate being served by summer EBT? And this will be the first summer that we're doing it. So we, we won't post it without going over full yeah. prize. So uh, throw out some numbers. Yeah. Oh, total, total. How many students will benefit from this new program? 200,000, okay. Higher, higher. Million, million. How many? Three, okay. Okay, well, it, it it's 21 million. So a lot of students will benefit from this program. And again, not every state is doing it, but we're I'm so thankful that Kansas is doing it. So again, first summer, so we're really excited about that. All right, next question. FNS's largest nutrition assistance program. Is it food distribution programs on Indian reservations, supplemental nutrition assistance program, the WIC program, or child and adult care food program? Larger. Okay, we got WIC, we got SNAP. It is SNAP. SNAP is our largest program. And so how many people do you think are served by SNAP? Millions, yep. I, mean, I want to give away a prize, y'all. Get close. Get close. What's it? How many? 41. 41. Did you? Did you? No. <laughs> oh, I can't. Oh, I can't go. No, that. You can do that one. So now we'll we'll fruit notes here, please. So good. 41 million. Very good. All right. Next question. This program provides supplemental food. Health care referrals and nutrition education for low income pregnant, breastfeeding, and non breastfeeding postpartum women and infants and children up to age five who are found to be at nutritional risk. So, is that TFAP, the emergency food assistance, WIC, child and adult care, or the summer food service program? What do you think? WIC. Everybody agree? Yeah, so correct. WIC. So, how many individuals do you think participate in WIC, in WIC each month? Not as, mu not as much as SNAP. 15, okay, okay. A little bit lower, lower. Okay. Five million. Okay, so that's close. So I think five, so, okay, so you get a, you get a five. It's actually 6.3 million. So, yeah, 6.3 million a month. And so, yeah, yeah. So, so for every dollar invested in the WIC program, it saves almost how much in cost? Two fifty. Two fifty. Anybody? Don't give what? Four dollars. Four dollars. Okay. I, I wish it was four dollars. It's two fifty. 
Um, but we know that with work, um, better outcomes for um, children, infants, and for moms. So we work. And then I think this is our last question. This program works to improve the health of seniors 60 years and older with supplemental food. And so, yeah, it, and, yeah food distribution program on Indian reservations, TFAP, SNAP, commodity supplemental, or child and adult care food program. What, what do we have? So see, so I hope you're learning something because you know these are some programs some of you haven't heard of. So for this one, it's the Commodity Supplemental Food Program. So seniors are able to get like a box of, of you know nutritious foods from there. So how many of you think participate in this program? And this is a much smaller program. 800, 800. Okay. No. Okay. Well, that's close. It's about six hundred and fifty-nine thousand. All right. So, just a little bit. So, do, does everybody know a little bit more about USDA program? So, how how are we? How do we work? So, we have seven regional offices, and I am in the Midwest region. Our office is in Chicago, and our national office is in Alexandria, Virginia. So. In our offices, we do more work with the state agencies to make sure that programs are administered properly. We do technical assistance and training for our state partners. And at national office, they do more with policy. And so students or retirees who may be interested in coming back to work. So positions at FNS, we have program specialists. They do research, they do technical assistance, monitoring and oversight, and a lot of training. We have nutritionist positions at FNS, data analysts, financial and human resource management, information technology, people in management roles. So there are a lot of opportunities at FNS, and hopefully you will consider some of those. And we have several hiring pathways. You know, you can come in from the public which I did, federal employees. We also hire a lot of Peace Corps volunteers and veterans. And we also have student internships as well. And so and as we get ready to wrap up, just some, some things that I've, I've learned that have really stuck with me. I think that I've been with USDA since 2010. So some of the, and these are some of the positions that I've had. I came in as the regional WIC director, I've been a branch chief for schools and food distribution, the director for special nutrition programs, which includes WIC and the child nutrition programs and food distribution. And now I'm the regional administrator. But just some lessons learned, some of those early lessons, again, don't be a sore loser. I've had a number of jobs since I've been there, but there certainly have been other opportunities that I applied for that I did not get. But when I did not get the job, it's kind of like, okay, you know, maybe that wasn't the time. You know, you always ask for feedback. But again, don't be a sore loser because some of the same people who interviewed you and you're a sore loser, you know, those are some of the same people who may interview you for other positions. So the same person who um, did not offer me a job there, you know, I was able to get the regional administrator job, which is um, such an excellent opportunity. I'm, I'm still learning. I think we all need to be lifelong learners whenever there are opportunities. Um, I've gone to Harvard for classes. I've done a Federal Executive Institute. And I also still learn from my staff. Even though I'm the leader, everybody can be a leader. So whether the person who cleans the bathroom or the, uh, the secretary, there's something that we can learn from everyone. So always keep that in mind. Um, always be ready and willing to take chances. You know, sometimes we go into a position thinking like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to do this. But having support, you can definitely make it happen. I remember talking to my dad saying, again, not sure if I can do this. And he gave a great example. The president of the United States, when they start their job, for them, they've never been president before, right? But they figure it out. They have people around them who can support them. So you can do this too. Um, get involved when there are opportunities. You just never know where opportunities will lead. I remember being asked to do something in an elevator 
which led to a great opportunity to lead some folks throughout our organization, and it creates exposure for you. So always get involved, get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, there are going to be tough times, things we don't want to do, but, you know, you, you can do it. So be comfortable, uh, get comfortable being uncomfortable, and then just team. None of us can do anything by ourselves. Our teams are so important. So really motivating and working closely with your teams and collaborating is critical. And then just working at USDA Evanes, just a couple pictures. Um, the top picture at Will County, that was the health department. Congresswoman Lauren Underwood came out to visit. So we went out and did some visits with her. Um, that was a panel that I was on, my plate picture with, I've gotten to meet governors, lieutenant governors. The picture in the bottom, in the middle, that was at in Clear Lake, Iowa. I went there for school, school lunch week about a year ago, and they recently got an award. So I got to go back a couple weeks ago with Secretary Bill Sack um, and just kind of recognize them. And then that's working with like one of our tribal partners or, or a, one of the, our tribal affairs specialists. And then two, Again, just some other things. The picture in the top. This is a picture from our office, our wall in the office that says, in this office, we are successful, we respect, we collaborate, we are a team, we inspire, and we have fun. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. We, we do those things. Um, just more pictures of my team, pictures out and about at the school. Love, absolutely love going to school, talking to kids about school lunch. Um, and that picture in the middle was um, a group of individuals who worked on the Flint water crisis. So for my team, we were recognized with the Abraham Lincoln Award, which is a very high honor at USDA for the work that we did in Flint. And I shared with the students earlier, as a result of my work in Flint as well, I was able to meet the president of the United States. I got to meet President Obama. And I remember getting an email from the White House saying, you know, the president is coming to Flint. You, we want you to be there. And me thinking like they sent this to the wrong person. <laughs> Certainly they didn't mean for this to go to me. They mean they want like the person who's the regional administrator. And I said, no, no. They were like, no, no. We, we want you to come. You were the first person on the ground from the agency to come. So we want you to be there. But other people certainly helped as well. And we were a team to help address the Flint water crisis. So just some other pictures from other things, get, get out a lot, get to do a lot of traveling. And just along this journey, got to keep it, keep it all in, in perspective. I love my job. I love the people I work with. But what's most important is our family. So we got to have a balance and keep that in perspective. Now, certainly, these are some old pictures. The little boy in the middle just turned 13 last week. But I love that picture. And, um, you know, my family and just traveling, really love that too. And I did share, I love game shows too. So that was when I was on The Price is Right. My husband was on The Price is Right and won a car. I went on The Price is Right and won a hot tub and a sauna. So we are a Price is Right family. So gotta have fun too. That's really important. So I'll just close with saying that's been my journey. Um, hope that some of the lessons were helpful for you or some of them you can really relate to. But how will you navigate your journey is a question that I have for you. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any, but just really appreciate the opportunity to, to share my story. Um, and it's just an honor to be here. So thank you. Sound, so. oh, no. um, are there any questions for Dr. Fletcher? Yeah, this, 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 yeah, they're pretty loud. Do, do you want this? Do you want this? Yeah. Now, if y'all don't have questions for me, I'll have no questions. Oh, he's still had to turn out of the Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> These mics up here are working as well. Oh, go ahead. Just be happy.
Um, I appreciate your lecture. Thank you so much. It was super enjoyable, Dr. Fletcher. Uh, my name is Eric Lindshield. I work in nutrition and dietetics and health. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank and you. in one of the earlier, earlier grad classes today, I was able to be able to watch you um, speak to our grad students. And you brought up the summit that happened, the child hunger summit. Mm -hmm. And there was a very big idea of like universal free school lunch. Mm -hmm. Uh, any updates that you know? So, you know, universal school lunch right now, that's not something that, you know, Congress, we're going to do right now. But a lot of states, several states, and I know, for example, two states in our region, Michigan and Minnesota, they have healthy school meals for all. And I was in both states, in, in Minnesota in particular, they talked about the increase, like a 37% increase in meals. I went to a school breakfast there. I have never seen so many students. I mean, the line was like from here to there for school breakfast. So it, it works. So um, right now, you know, individual states are, you know, making decisions, but in, in where they're doing that, we've seen some positive results, but yeah, not, not, not quite yet. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yep. So now I will ask some questions if y'all don't have any. So, oh, question over here. So, was you work in the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. So, it was related to nutrition, and I remember when you know we really start hearing a lot about the Flint water crisis. It was a Friday afternoon. I went to my boss, and I remember saying like, "Hey, Flint is in our region." I feel like we need to be doing something. And, you know, at that moment, we didn't know what to do. But that weekend, there was a huge call with, like, other federal agencies saying, like, we need to do something. And guess who they called and said, you're going to Flint. <laughs> it was me. I don't know if it was because I brought something up, but they're like, we need someone to go. So you go to Flint. So I was the first person on the ground from our agency in Flint. And what we did was, you know, we know that nutrition can help mitigate lead absorption. So we met with, I met with school food service. We went to WIC to find out how we could be helpful. So one of the things that we did was really try to provide more food items that were high in things like vitamin C and iron that could help really with mitigating lead. We, we actually came up with a toolkit. Again, it was a collective effort so that others and others have asked for and used our toolkit to help them do that. But really just trying to help with the nutritional aspect. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. So, somebody else? Okay, Dr. Bull. Are you sure? You know, in place for the NPDC program, the nation was not able to Yeah, yeah. So, we are working with our state partners. So, it is, it's a brand new program, but certainly integrity is really important. So, we'll be working closely with our state partners to make sure that the funds go where they're supposed to go. And again, you mean like the individual student, like they need to qualify for free or reduced price meals or to be directly certified. So all those things will be looked at closely. And parents, you know, even if they qualify, if they don't want to participate, there'll be options for that as well. So there are some things in place, but again, it's the first year of the program. So I'm sure there'll be some lessons learned. Will it have limits like that with the types of things that they can purchase with that, 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 that well with with summer EBC no and there it there now for tr traditional summer EBC there's not just like snap you know they can purchase food but again we know how expensive food is right now so every dollar you know that gives them more money to get those fresh fruits and fresh vegetables um there is wit Tribes who administer WIC can also participate. So their their model is going to be more like the WIC model. So, yeah. Anything else? So if, if there is anything else for me for students, I would like to know, is there anything that resonated with you? Any message that you will take forward with you as you go on throughout your career journey? Some, and I always say, so I have to give at least one to be dismissed. You got to have some. <laughs> Okay, I really, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. My name is Jay, I'm currently a senior, um, getting ready to graduate. So, you know, lots of um, challenges coming my way, but I really enjoyed your um, story whenever you were in grade school and 
handling failure is hard for a child. So, um, but yeah, just handling, being able to take it gracefully um, and um, learn from it. Mm -hmm. so, you know, grad student or just you know, current student, mm -hmm. you're going to run into it. So how you handle that really just speaks about how you are as a person and how you're able to overcome. So, thank you, thank you. And like I said, it was that early, you know, all, our childhoods really shape who we are. So that early message from my from my parents was like, no, no, we will not tolerate this. And I think from then on, when I would go into things, a job, I'll say I'm gonna do my best. If it works out, great. But if not, you know, there'll be other opportunities. So it's just kind of how you set yourself up. I just was so devastated because I was just so overconfident that like I got this. So yeah, that was a good lesson early on for me. Okay, another question. My former my name is Jennifer. And one of the challenges that I had was thinking about the career and I think was how we are on the option team, but in the So I really appreciate your perspective for like experience. Yeah. The many different types of jobs and why you started in the area. Thank you, thank you. And, and and like I said, it was you never know where you're gonna end up. And and I would say to students too, really be open. Like try not to limit your opportunity. If I even said no, I'm gonna stay in Mulberry. You know, I would not have been given the opportunities that I am. So the more open you are to saying like, hey, I can get out of my comfort zone. I can go do something a little different. It really opens you up for opportunities. So I would definitely say, you know, be willing to go different places. And you just never know where you're going. I didn't know about jobs at USDA. I thought school food service, but never even thought about a job at USDA. But it really made sense. I worked at the state level and local level. So federal level was kind of, it made sense to be there. And, and just a great group of people and a great mission. So lovely work. So I think we have time. I think it's OK, thank you. Thanks, everyone. So thank you, Dr. Fletcher. I, I don't think this is working, but I can speak loudly. No, that's fine. So this concludes um, our lecture series for this year. We do have light refreshments out in Hoffman Lounge. So if your schedule allows, please uh, just have some refreshments. And those you may want to go up and talk a little more to Dr. Fletcher. That is welcome. And thank you all for just coming to spend a small part of your day with us. So have a great afternoon. Or excuse me. Yeah. Thank you.